See that double base back there? No, not the metal one, the wood one. I made that out of hollow core doors and some old fence boards. And it's a very big and complicated build. It's so big and so complicated, I'm splitting it up over three videos. I'm doing a voiceover on this video, so I'm gonna explain a lot of the stuff that's going on. Let's dig in, there's a lot to cover. This build is a big step uh, towards a future dream of mine, of, of some double base ideas that I have. And I thought before I tackled those, I should try to make one that was, quote, traditional. So I started by designing the basic shapes in V-Carve, and I made some molds as well. Um, then I moved over to my Maslow CNC um, and used that to cut out some templates, the back of the base, and also these molds that I'm going to use out of uh, three-quarter inch plywood. I thought this was a fun idea. Instead of breaking down the hollow core door like I usually do, I just stuck the whole door right on the CNC and I used the cardboard that was inside the door to keep the piece from flying off when it was cut out. Um, kind of like a, a hold down, almost like I glued it to the board, but I didn't have to glue it and I didn't have to leave tabs. And that uh, actually worked out really well for me. I made several of these so I could experiment with them in case any got wrecked and I wasn't sure if I was going to double up the back or not. I ended up not. Obviously the back doesn't have holes in it, so this one was just a template that I cut for helping me uh, lay it out and design it. I wanted to get it into the real world. Uh, so now I'm cutting out out of some scrap pieces of three quarter inch plywood these molds that I'm going to use. And I, I cut the exterior profile of the instrument four times, and then I also had the interior profile as waste. I'm a cheapskate and a reclaimer, so I, I made this work out of some material that I had left over and if I were to do this again I would do some things differently here primarily I would actually spend a few bucks and get a piece of plywood so all my sizes would be consistent and uh, I wouldn't have little holes in it like you can see there at the bottom of that piece but now my sides are going to be two layers of eighth inch hollow core door skins so that's a quarter inch and so this worked out really well I just used a quarter inch router bit and cut it all out and now the two pieces fit together exactly as they will with a quarter inch of material in between them if you watch my video where I made an acoustic guitar on just the laser using hollow core doors, this was the trick I came up with then where I half cut through the wood on the laser to give it a curve and it becomes like wacky wood. So this gives me the ability to bend it. The whole design revolves around this concept of me taking two layers of this and gluing them together in their bent shape and then they should become somewhat rigid. We'll talk more about this pallet wood that I'm using in part two, but let me take a minute to describe the base that I'm building. It's what would be called a hybrid double base. Now traditionally double bases and violins and all those instruments are carved from real wood, usually lighter woods like spruce and whatnot with maple and other materials for the neck. And um, they're all just as real wood. And then in the 20th century, they started making them out of plywood. In recent years, they've started making hybrid bases that have the durability of the plywood back in size, but then the added sound quality of the carved top. Now this is my first test of my system with my molds that I made to see if this is even going to work. This is like the moment of truth. Uh, I let this sit overnight and I don't know if this is going to work or not. My whole plan sort of hinges on this working. If it doesn't there's other solutions of course, but I really wanted to do it this way. So, let's see what happens. Ha <laughs> ha! Looking good already. Oh yeah. See, now there has to be a little bit of, uh, there's not, there's no flex at all in it now. So, I have to make the other pieces to see what's going to happen in these corners. I thought that I might still be able to bend it a little um, to sort of finagle it into place. So if I can't, I might have to do this differently. And what I would do is I would just use the one layer when it still has some flexibility and maybe create the whole shape and then glue the second layer inside. But come on, that looks cool. Well, I have a feeling I'll end up making more of these before I get the ones I use, but uh, I'll keep going, see what happens. I ended up using all my first takes for these parts, um, but if I were to do it again, I would definitely do things different. I would make better molds. Um, they would be probably solid all the way through. I would have them all consistent sizes instead of cutting them out of scraps. 
Um, and uh, I had to do some adjustments on these molds as I went because of that. I, you'll see later in the video I'd make them thinner and i take them apart and stuff. But um, I would also change the shape in general so these molds will never get used again. So I think the better way to do this in the future would be to actually have molds that are all three sections that are individual. So I could mold this part, if this was cut right here and here, I could just go down straight and then cut it to length to fit later. Same here, I could have this go beyond the position that it needs to go, have this go beyond the position it needs to go, and then I could cut them all to fit later. So we're going to see what will happen with these. If it doesn't work, I'll go out and I'm going to keep these molds for doing the final assembly and I'll make some new molds where I section this off into three parts. A little later you'll see what I did um, to solve this problem in the corners of there not being enough material. But first I'm just kind of laying it out and seeing what I've got. And then I have to shape the top pieces uh, to make the back slant a little bit because the base is not as wide at the top as it is at the bottom. There's a slight slope to it. Long time viewers of mine know that at one point in time I was pretty down on CNC. I had no interest in it, but I forced myself to learn and now I am drinking the Kool-Aid and I'm hooked. That means I don't use any computer-aided equipment. Computer-aided equipment. So that said, one of the things that keeps people out of the CNC world is the expense. It is a huge expense to buy a CNC machine, not knowing whether you're going to take to it and like it or find a way to make use of it in your shop. And that's where the Maker Made CNC comes in. The Mazula CNC was invented a few years ago and it's an open source thing, so it's been growing and developing for several years now into a better and better low-cost project kind of CNC machine to get you in the game. No, it does not replace a vertical $10,000 CNC machine. It's a $500 CNC machine that just about anybody can afford and they can put in their shop where they're taking up a relatively small amount of space. Um, as you can see here, I've built mine into a lumber rack. And um, it gets you going in the game. Maker Made CNC and I have been forging a relationship for the past year and uh, I really like what they're all about and I wholeheartedly support what they're trying to do. Uh, it is not replacing my multi-thousand dollar machine I have in the other bay. It's not supposed to. It does what it does and I'm glad to have it. Thank you very much Maker Made CNC for believing in me and supporting this project in this video. I could not have done it without you. I made this quick sandpaper board for sanding out the sides and I made it long enough to reach across the whole instrument because I figured when I get it together I might need that sanding ability as well. Then I did some final measuring and trimming to get all my pieces ready to be glued together. I screwed the mold onto my workbench so it would not move and um, I started preparing some more wood for bracing on the interior of the instrument using the trim of the hollow core doors. So these corners were my biggest concern because of the way the molds were made and I decided the best thing to do would just be to glue a piece of solid wood in there to attach them all instead of trying to force them to fit to take a little extra off and create a spline that would go there. Uh, this worked okay. I added a little CA glue there as a, sort of a quick clamp, and then I filled it in with this Total Boat Thixo epoxy that was sort of filling the gaps, and it cured pretty quickly so I was able to keep working. And um, that seemed all right. Obviously, the more pieces we get adhere to each other in the opposite directions and whatnot, the stronger it will get. But um, before I did that, I did spend just a lot of time really playing with making sure everything was going to line up. Once the 300 different kinds of glue I had used had all cured up, I went and cleaned up these edges, and I kind of liked the look. At first I thought I would just cover them with veneer, but I decided I liked the look of it. Uh, however, they weren't quite strong enough for me yet, I felt, so I went in with some CA glue and some scraps of veneer and made these little patches, like a little hinge almost, that did the job. That made me feel confident that everything was going to stay together. <laughs> This is my 1930s aluminum double base. This was my office for about a decade. I worked on this thing almost every day of the week. And uh, if you want to hear this base, but more importantly, you want to hear 
this base stacked up next to that base, stacked up next to a 1956K and my fully carved 1920s Czechoslovakian base, go to my other YouTube channel, which is New Perspectives Music. I'm doing a shootout where I'm putting these things under a real microphone so you can hear them next to each other. Uh, I think it should be kind of interesting to see how garbage stacks up next to like a real carved base, next to like the industry standard plywood base, next to this tin can. As I prepared to start gluing stuff together, I've decided to reduce the height of my molds because the whole base isn't 8 inches high. There's that part that dips down to 5 inches and I wanted to be able to get in there with clamps and whatnot. So I did that and screwed those down to the bench and then I took apart one of my interior pieces and just screwed those down to the bench too to keep everything aligned properly as I cleaned up the edges and prepared them for gluing. Since the whole glue edge is only a quarter inch thick, besides the tail block and the neck block, um, I thought it'd be nice to have a couple other spots that I could get a little more glue adhesion on to attach the back to the side. So I made these little spots uh, to just sort of give me a little extra glue support. This is how instruments are traditionally made. Uh, is with hide glue which is made from horses like when you watch those old Bugs Bunny cartoons and they're like saying how the horses were going to go to the glue factory that's a real thing uh, nowadays we have all these modern glues and I obviously as a vegetarian prefer to use them as well as just a guy with a soul but uh, the reason hide glue is good and it's still used in traditional instruments is that you can actually take it apart pretty easily with some heat and pressure whereas with a wood glue the wood glue like the wood's always going to break before the wood glue so um I use it sparingly and I'm going to use it in certain joints in this base where I might need to take it apart for future repairs. Hide glue comes dry in a flake form. It almost looks like a rawhide dog chew toy ground up. And you mix it by equal parts weight. So I just set up this simple little scale. And then you need to heat it up in a double boiler. So I have this little mini kind of crock pot that I picked up at Goodwill a bunch of years ago. Okay, that's more like it. Now we got some glue. Heat and steam are your friends when working with hide glue. A warm shop and a steamy shop will help, and steam is good for breaking the joints apart too, because it won't cure as fast. If it's cold and dry, the stuff cures really quickly. You don't even have time to glue two things together. So it will be good enough to take the clamps off relatively quickly, but it does need to sit for a little while to really do its job and, and bind up good. I was a little nervous about being able to get all the glue on there and getting it assembled and stuck together fast enough. Um, so I was kind of rushing and feeling the pressure. I ended up having to redo the top half of the base because um, I sort of let that slide while I was working. Um, but it all came together okay. Once I had it together enough to flip it over, I painted the inside seam as well, just for extra adhesion. And then I used a uh, pattern router bit to trim off my excess back. How how long? Well, I spent I spent a lot more time thinking than I spent working. Yeah. And looking at that's things. basically woodworking. People think woodworking is like running it through a saw, but it's really measuring and it's, like. Well, what's the saying? Measure. Measure twice, cut once. More like measure seven times and cut once. Yeah, and have a plan before you even get to the point of measuring and cutting. And uh, but I like to go on the fly. So there's a few things I haven't figured out yet that I'm figuring out. So what I'm doing is would be called prototyping. Now, if my son Vance were in charge of the project, I wouldn't have to do this because he would have measured it all and figured it out. But me, I messed up. And fortunately, I used hide glue, so I was able to break this neck block apart, sand off the excess glue, and then reset it. I made a couple rookie mistakes here that I didn't notice until I flipped this thing over and started looking at it. But uh, I should have just done the sides and not tried to glue the blocks in at the same time because this block was a little bit crooked. And the other thing is, is that since the back slants, this should slant too, so it gets a full purchase, and it doesn't, it kind of floats, and only the tip is getting there. So I'm going to glue another, some blocks of wood or some wood onto the bottom of this so I can shape it in to fit this body, and then line it all up nice and straight, glue it in, and then clean it all up. And my tail piece, I think I'm going to be okay. Um, we'll find out. That all works pretty well, and then from some of my hollow core door cutoffs from the trim, I started making some of the bracing pieces that I would put on the inside of the instrument to keep it from just collapsing under the tension. And we'll talk more about some of that stuff later, too. This wide piece was book matched from one of the bottom pieces of the door. And that's what the inside of the base looks like at this point. Um, it is all 100% hollow core door except for the neck block and the tail block. Those are from pallet wood ash. If you like this sort of thing, I'd recommend you go check out my channel some more. You can see 
This is a double bass that I made out of a snow ski. <laughs> this is a, a bass guitar I made out of a water ski. Here's a guitar I made out of aluminum. There's my, my skateboard slide guitar. What else we got over here? We got, oh, this is my, um, my detachable guitar that comes apart and makes other instruments. That's made out of a hog. I got a ton of videos about making instruments out of garbage all over this channel. And uh, <laughs> these are just the ones that are still hanging around the shop. So go check out my other videos. You might find something you like. Make sure you tune into part two and three to see the rest of this build. I hope you enjoyed part one. I'm gonna stop it here for now and you'll see that I was kind of jumping around the timeline a little bit trying to divide the project into chunks that made sense, not necessarily the order that I did them. So thanks for watching. Make sure you check out Maker Made CNC and uh, I will see you in the next video.